October is ADHD Awareness Month. I thought I'll talk about what's behind the increase in ADHD awareness and diagnosis and why we're seeing more ADHD content, related content on social media. And something to note is that before the pandemic, there was already research evidence to suggest that ADHD diagnosis was on the rise. Science. Science. Technology. Technology. Medicine. Medicine. Health. Health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast. A weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health. Answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes. A tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimey Abraham. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another fantastic episode of Monday Science. How have you all been? Hope you've had a great start to the week. Or if you're listening to this and it's not on a Monday, I hope your week or your day is going well. Thank you for the comments, feedback, and everything from last week's episode, episode 153, Why Do People Find True Crime Relaxing? We had some comments on YouTube. I'd like to give a shout out to Tina Ryan, Sam Bailey, Amy Johnson, who commented and also took time to share how they've also been using true crime and also some recommendations. Like it was really good. I think it was Tina that recommended true crime loser. So I'm definitely going to check that out. Now, today's episode, October is ADHD Awareness Month. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. So some of you know, I'm a pharmacist and over the years I've been practicing for about 15 years. Yeah, I've been a qualified pharmacist for, and over the years I've seen an increase in ADHD prescriptions that have come through. So I myself have noticed in my practice the rise and I thought I'll talk about what's behind the increase in ADHD awareness and diagnosis. Some things that I found out that could be influencing the increase in ADHD awareness and diagnosis. And that's really related to the impact the pandemic, but more so like the lockdowns and things like that, that's had on increased awareness and then in turn diagnosis. And then also why we're seeing more ADHD content, related content on social media. And something to note is that before the pandemic, there was already research evidence to suggest that ADHD diagnosis was on the rise. So for the example, in 2018, there was a paper that was published in JAMA Network Open, which explored 20 year trends ADHD diagnosis amongst US children and adolescents between the ages of four and 17. And this was between 1997 and 2016. The study found that amongst children and as adolescents, so that's between age four to 17, the estimated prevalence of diagnosis of ADHD increased significantly between 1997 to 1998 and 2015 and to, to 2016. There was also an article in The Guardian in 2018 that highlighted the findings from a report by a think tank called Demos, which highlighted that undiagnosed adult ADHD could cost the UK billions per year. And the report had stated that awareness of ADHD in adults in particular was very poor and many people were going undiagnosed and untreated. And then if we bring it more Recently. Over the last few years, there's been a rise of ADHD related content, particularly on TikTok. The positive is that, you know, this can be a good way to destigmatize ADHD, share research, create a new community to a new demographic. And the negative side of this could be increased um, and dangerous self diagnosis, misinformation, and potentially spreading more untruths that further would stigmatize people with ADHD. It's important to highlight that the aim of today's episode is to provide general information, not advice. There's some things I want to explore today. I want to talk about what is ADHD. 
are there any differences in how ADHD presents between children and adults, between men and women? What is known about how the pandemic, and, and I want to be clear, it's more how the effects of the pandemic, so I'm not talking about COVID-19 infections, but more the pandemic, the lockdowns. What is known about how that so has had on ADHD awareness and diagnosis? What role does social media play, positive and negative? And the things that I'm not covering in today's episode is the impact of social media itself on ADHD and the impact of COVID-19 infections on ADHD in terms of potentially symptom exacerbation or inducing ADHD-like symptoms. I'd like to cover those two points in upcoming episodes because it's quite a lot to delve into as well. The Royal College of Psychiatrists states that ADHD is a pattern of behaviours that usually appear in childhood. The symptoms of ADHD can be categorised into two main types of behavioural problems. So there's inattentiveness, which can be referred to as difficulty concentrating and focusing, and then there's hyperactivity and impulsiveness. Many people with ADHD have problems that fall into both categories, but it's not always the case. And I would say that I think for many years, the I would say this more as a stigma associated with ADHD was more that hyperactive hyperactivity and impulsiveness as well for a long time it was thought that adhd was primarily a condition in boys and some men but it is really worth remembering that adhd is not gender biased but what led to this so there was an article written in psychiatry uk and this is a national online psychiatry service. And this article was written by Dr. Netu Johnson, who is a consultant psychiatrist in neurodevelopment disorders. And in the article, she talks about how the clinical picture of ADHD differs in males and females. So it's important to note that ADHD symptoms in both males and females are in the same proportions. However, there is a huge diagnostic gap and diagnostic profile more with males almost three times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than females. ADHD does present and look different in women. And for this reason, many women have grown up feeling misunderstood, sometimes Hmm. their difficulties are mistaken as being hormonal or anxious but research has shown that women or girls are less also less likely to be diagnosed as parents are not quite sure parents and teachers or carers are not quite sure what to look out for even if they were to notice difficulties as well so therefore inattentive ADHD so remember inattentive is difficulty concentrating and focusing. So inattentive ADHD is more commonly diagnosed in women than it is in boys and men, whereas the diagnosis for boys and men tends to lean more towards the hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. So somebody may not have had symptoms that were recognized or diagnosed as a child, but as a child, they would have had symptoms that have just gone undiagnosed until adulthood. Adults with ADHD they are more likely to have at least one other disorder. And then more than 50% of adults with ADHD will have two. And then more than 33% of adults with ADHD are likely to have three other disorders. These disorders can include depression, like alcohol and drug use, misuse, anxiety, and other such disorders as well. So what could be causing the rise of ADHD diagnosis since the start of the pandemic? Now, as I said, I'm focusing more on the impact the pandemic has had, not the COVID-19 virus itself. I think it's important, you know, now for, and I'm talking about my UK experience, we're pretty much back to pre-pandemic behavior if you think about I mean the people that still wear masks but if we think about social distancing quarantining things like that in the UK we are pretty much as it was before March 2020 I think it was March 13th wasn't it that we went into lockdown I I can't remember specific dates and I've you know I've been privileged enough to travel a fair bit this year for conferences and I've seen that other parts of the world are pretty much the same as it was before 
If we look at pandemic related factors that could have been responsible for ADH symptom escalation in children, it could contribute to increased screen time. So being at home, quarantining, online remote schooling, cancelled off-screen activities, social isolation from friends and peers, social isolation from friends and peers, reduced physical outlets, lack of dedicated time and personal attention from in-person teaching, lack of daily routine and structure. That's a big one. And then changes in the home situation. So unfortunately, children who may have experienced a loss of a loved one, moving, parent separation, or even an arrival of a new sibling. With children spending even more time with their parents and carers, the parents of carers would then be witnessing firsthand their, ch their child's attention and education difficulties, which they may be facing, which would then have led them to seek diagnosis and treatment for their children. Now, if we think about pandemic-related factors responsible for ADHD symptom increase in adults, common factors that contributed to ADHD-related symptoms to flare up included, for example, increased anxiety and stress related to the pandemic, working from home without usual external motivators, focus, being at home, being an additional source or, you know, new sources of distraction, as well as being isolated from people. So less social interaction, spending more time on social media platforms. Now, I read a lot of articles that talked about the influence that social media had, has, had and has, has and had on ADHD. Then other factors that could have escalated symptoms in adults, lack of daily routine and structure, including mealtime, sleep patterns, exercise. And then, you know, significant life changes around the pandemic. For example, ending of a relationship, losing of a loved one, moving house, having a baby, losing or starting a job, many different factors. Attitude magazine, which is a leading source of important news, expert advice, and judgment-free understanding for families and adults conducted survey where they found that many adults noted that being home all day, whether with family or alone, it took away their usual coping strategies and heightened anxiety and stress-related issues. This is just highlighting how pandemic factors over the last few years could have been responsible for ADHD symptom escalation in children or in adults, but that ADHD doesn't start in adulthood, perhaps before the pandemic, especially for in, if we look at undiagnosed adults with ADHD, they may have been just coping or finding some ways or coping strategies with this undiagnosed condition. And then the pandemic escalated certain symptoms, which then led to diagnosis. And then also we've got challenges around access to appropriate healthcare, which would then have prevented or delayed diagnosis. One thing we all did in the pandemic is turn to social media. Now, I'm just going to put out here, I did turn to social media, Instagram, but I didn't really catch on to TikTok. I was one of those that I would just be on Instagram and then whatever came through to Instagram, Instagram and Twitter, and then whatever came through to Instagram, I'll be like, sure, I'll, I'll see this. So I, I didn't really get into TikTok, but we know that TikTok went on the rise over the pandemic. I'm going to talk a little bit about TikTok, but first, I just want to highlight that as it relates to, so social media and health information, but if we make it more specific about ADHD, social media can be a place where people can share what it's like to live with a condition if we're focusing on ADHD today. Yeah, social media can be good because it can raise awareness of ADHD and perhaps potentially more acceptance, but I've already highlighted some of the negatives. And in terms of early example of viral ADHD related content, this started in December, 2018 by Danny Donovan, who is an artist and a designer. And she rose to fame when she shared a flow chart that she designed trying to show the difference between a non-ADHD non and somebody with ADHD telling a story. And this blew up and got over 100 million views over various social media platforms. 
somehow TikTok has played a role in increasing awareness, content, self-diagnosis and more of ADHD and neurodiversity in general. And there's still like, there's still a lot of debate on really how this has happened. But if we talk about TikTok now, I am relatively new to TikTok. I don't want to be judged, <laughs> but I am. To be honest, why I didn't join TikTok in the height of the pandemic, although now I'm like, oh, maybe I should have. But why I didn't join it? Because as far as I understood it, it was for dancing and doing challenges. I have no intention. Let me actually, I was about to say, I have no intention of dancing on social media, but you just never know where the world will take you really, isn't it? But that's actually why I didn't join social media. I enjoyed the dances. I'm sorry, social media, TikTok. I enjoyed the one, two step, <laughs> I sound a thousand years old, but I, I enjoyed watching the videos when they arrived on Instagram of people doing dances. And it was like, that's nice, but not for me. So I, I didn't use TikTok before, but I've started using it more recently. <laughs> Follow me. Hello at Dr. B. Jeremy A. Sure. I'm a shameless plug, but I've started using TikTok because to share information and advice around what it takes to be a PhD researcher, a day in a life, I, I enjoy it. But let's just have a quick history of TikTok because it is quite an interesting platform. So there was an app that was called Musical.ly, spelled musical.ly. Why? Musically. Maybe I said that wrong. So this was a short form, 15 second video streaming app that had over a million users until August, 2018. And that app allowed users to have a use of music and dialogue options where they could lip sync and make fun, money, funny or entertaining videos. In August, 2018, the app was taken over by a Chinese company called Byte Dance and all users were then moved onto TikTok. And then all of the content on the accounts that were musically, they were all transferred onto the new TikTok app. So TikTok contains a separate app for the Chinese market called Do Doin, called Doin, which has over 300 million active monthly users. And the new logo is a combination, or the TikTok logo is a combination of Musical.ly and Doin. So TikTok then became a short form video sharing app where there was dancing. I still remember the dancing <laughs> where users were allowed to create fifth. So TikTok then became a short video sharing app that originally allowed users to create and share 15 second videos on any topic, but now you can create up to three minute videos and you'd know and notice the trend between whatever TikTok does, Instagram then follows. I feel sorry for Instagram. Instagram seems to be just the playground where, where all content from all different platforms just comes there to chill. Nobody really talks about Snapchat anymore, but I don't know. Do you guys still use Snapchat? I don't know. So anyway, how did TikTok rise to popularity? Well, it seems like I, there's another reference of 2018. We're all worried about 2020 was the year that things changed, but it turns out a lot happened in 2018. I think we've been all, we've been looking at it wrong. But how did TikTok rise to popularity? So in 2018, it was the most downloaded photo and video app in the app store globally. I am worried that it all started to go wrong in 2018. <laughs> we laugh. We, I. So some of the key reasons why TikTok surged in popularity. So they had, the app had global celebrity endorsements who then helped to drive the app's popularity. The fact that it was global, that contributed to its geographical expansion. The app, the celebrities, and then the influencers. So like being a TikTok influencer would then drive a buzz around the platform, create viral content and so forth. Then also we had, we, TikTok had, localized content because despite being a global app it has a strong focus on localized content it's easy content creation i have to say the app is good it is good sharing and viewing and then people say tiktok seems to be more authentic i'll tell you what is authentic the comment section gosh the comment section in tiktok can be so ruthless it's fascinating i mean i've just started on my journey with TikTok and I am, you know, creating what I hope to be meaningful content. When I look at some other people's, when I look at some other people's profiles and I see the comments, harsh. Anyway, and then also TikTok is unique. It is different. There is something different about it. I remember listening to, I listened to Gary Vay and his podcast. I remember he said that there was, I think it was earlier on this year or last year, that there are two platforms with organic like genuine organic reach 
that you don't need ads for your content to go far and that's TikTok and LinkedIn and what that means is that if you post something on TikTok if you post something on LinkedIn you don't need to pay for ads for people to see it whereas with Instagram particularly there is things. Sorry, I've gone into a bit of a sidetrack about <laughs> social media marketing. But anyway, essentially, TikTok has risen to popularity and we know it now. Like everybody, even if you're not on TikTok, on Instagram, you're going to see a lot of TikTok related content. So the ADHD hashtag on TikTok, I actually checked recently, it's about 16.8 billion views. I was reading an article on ADHD about ADHD on TikTok, the author being Jamie DeMuth. And this was part of the Attention magazine, which is a magazine from the children and adults with ADHD. It's called CHAD. It's an association. And uh, the Attention magazine, so they'd issued an article, it was this year, August. In the article, Jamie had interviewed an ADHD expert, Dr. Hallowell. And they credited the misinformation about ADHD on TikTok as uh, his reason for joining. So what he said was that where there was a gap, where there was a gap was a medical expert perspective. And so I decided to create some videos providing this, he says. TikTok is perfect for ADHD audience because the videos are short, punchy, and entertaining. He warns that not all content on TikTok is factual, nor does it replace seeing a doc doctor. TikTok became popular and there was a lot of new content during the pandemic particularly related to ADHD related content and that that has contributed to the spike uh, in ADHD awareness particularly among adolescents and young adults. So let's talk about benefits and risks of TikTok and ADHD awareness right. So if we look at some of the positives TikTok can make ADHD strategies more accessible you know people can look and say, oh, actually, I could try this skill. I could try this hack and so forth. Anthony Young, who's an MD and colleagues, reviewed 100 of the most popular TikTok videos on ADHD. And they found that though these videos were highly relatable, approximately 52% were misleading. And so the worry amongst ADHD professionals is that the large number of videos that contain misinformation are leading some TikTok users, or, and I'm going to even argue TikTok users, and then wherever those videos end up, to self-diagnose self and tr seek treatment that they may not actually need. And so whilst social media can help to reduce mental health stigma and improve health literacy, they are concerned about the t misinformation and the potential for health related anxiety and this i believe this is for adhd but it can be translated to other things these experts refer to this as something called cyberchondria so i guess like hypochondria cyberchondria and they attribute it to a volume of unmoderated user generated content i think that's the key point unmoderated and then it's user generated TikTok algorithms tend to show users similar related content, which can then increase the spread of misinformation. The other risk, oversimplification of ADHD, which can also pose a health risk. I came up across this very insightful article in Mashable by Jesse Joho, and it's titled, Why Everyone's Talking About ADHD Right Now and Why It's Kind of Annoying. In the article, Jess provides an example of somebody called Crawley who was procrastinating whilst working on a big paper for nursing school. And this person called Crawley wrote a satirical video, How to how to ADHD like a pro, which listed all her hyper-specific daily struggles. This video blew up overnight, had over 180,000 views. She increased number of followers and everything. And so on this, Crawley said, it was nice at first because I didn't really have anybody within close proximity to me that, uh, that are adults with ADHD. I felt like, ooh, I found my people, I found my tribe. Then... Crawley's For You page became overrun with ADHD TikTok. Even though quite a few of the posts were eye-opening and validating, she grew quite tired of this. And as she said, there's a lot of negative emotions attached to ADHD. Finding out you have it, especially when those of us are diagnosed late in life. So when it's being shoved down your throat like that with all the quote-unquote relatable content, I'm just finding more and more ways that my ADHD has invaded every day of my life. So it's depressing sometimes. I'm glad we're all relating, but also like, please leave me alone. 
I think that's very powerful, you know, just to show how for somebody who is diagnosed with ADHD, the impact of the excessive amount of content about the condition could then just make them feel worse, you know? So what are my thoughts? I want to focus specifically on the role of social media, specifically TikTok and ADHD. So some of the positives that I can see from what I've read about is sharing information about ADHD on social media is going to have a positive, for example, increased awareness, increased acceptance. It can be a good way for people to find new information, but that's dependent on the source of the new information. So hopefully the new information is from a, an expert. It can increase coverage to help normalize ADHD and reduce stigma. Social media can help to create online communities that can be made up of people who have ADHD or family members who are affected by this. And then particularly with the online communities, it can give people a chance to ask questions and get advice from those who can relate to the experiences. The negatives, I think, of the use of social media in general and ADHD is really around the availability of misleading uh, content and information that could lead to inaccurate self-diagnosis, as well as obviously misinformation. Then there's also typecasting. So while th whilst the hope is that these online ADHD posts about ADHD will lessen negative stereotypes, but they actually might reinforce stereotypes and then pigeonhole people with ADHD as well further. The other side of things is if somebody is then known as an influencer or an expert by way of they create content on social media platforms, this could be people who, you know, themselves are living with ADHD or they don't have ADHD, but they create ADHD related content. They could have people with ADHD or those undiagnosed reaching out for help. Um, via the social media platforms, via TikTok, via Instagram, or, or so forth. And they could have people reaching out to them when they're distressed or at a certain crisis point. This influencer is highly unlikely to be trained or equipped to deal with the vulnerable person. And that can lead to its own effects and consequences as a result of all of that. I think maybe there's a call to action for more experts to get on social media. And this is a very tricky, it's a bold call to action, if I do say so myself, because as an academic, you're told, oh, you've got to, you know, showcase your research and blah, blah, blah. And for a time, it felt like those of those of us who were using social media platforms to showcase our research, to give advice and so forth, were kind of looked down by those who weren't doing that. But now everybody is trying to do more, I say in a very blanket statement, but more people, more scientists and academics are trying to put themselves out there on social media, but really more to showcase the work they're doing, which is fine. Now, if I give advice on my social media, so I, I, what have I talked about? If I give advice about why to do a PhD, how you could do a PhD, that's fine. But now if we shift on as being a healthcare professional, if as a healthcare professional, I give advice, I give health advice, hmm, that can be a little bit of a tricky one in a gray area. And I think that's what prevents more experts going on social media platforms and talking more and giving advice. Some healthcare professionals can be quite hesitant to go on social media platform, social media platforms to give healthcare related advice. I've seen on some people's platforms where they say, yes, I'm a whatever healthcare professional they are, but I'm not going to give you advice. And I think they're well within their right. Healthcare professionals work and experts in this area need to feel comfortable and safe enough. And when I say safe, safe by way of their professional body or regulatory body is not going to penalize them for giving health advice or tackle misinformation. Healthcare professionals need to feel comfortable and safe by and protected by the professional body or their regulatory body to be able to dispel misinformation as it relates, for example, to ADHD. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know on our YouTube, on our social media platforms. You can find out where, we're, where we are on our website, www.mondayscientepodcast.com. And you can have access to our social media platforms. You could drop me a voice note. Let me know what you thought of this episode. Also, if you are an ADHD expert and you'd like to come on the, on the podcast and let's talk more about this and particularly to talk about the two areas I didn't focus on. So the impact of social media itself on ADHD, as well as the impact of the COVID-19 infection on ADHD in terms of symptom exacerbation or inducing ADHD-like symptoms. It'd be great to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening.